I need to begin by sharing with you the inspiration that I got for the message today. Earlier this week, Elena sent me to Safeway. I was just about my business, serving my wife. And I'm walking on out, and I see the strangest thing. I see a guy, kind of normal guy, come on out. And he seems just like me, kind of just doing his thing. And all of a sudden, this, this guy and him kind of get into it right outside of Safeway. And this one guy just goes, <laughs> spits on him. I mean, they, the guy just went ballistic. And so the title of the lesson is, Spit Changes Everything. <laughs> now, we're going to study about three blind men today. Let's turn our Bibles open to John chapter 9. Try it. Just spit on someone and see if it doesn't change. Begins verse 1, chapter 9. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Well, the disciples were a lot like us. They're walking along and they see this fellow that was born blind. And they said, Jesus, wh why is this? And, you know, there are a lot of people that say, well, why does this person get sick? Why is this person in this situation? We well, see, Jesus came to teach us about God. And one of the things that Jesus teaches us is that God is sovereign. In other words, everything that happens, either God makes happen or he allows it to happen. You say, well, why? What about all the bad stuff that happens in the world? What about all the people that are sick or that are hurting? Well, Jesus answers that question. See, some people assume when something bad happens to a person that they have sinned, God has smote them, or that somehow their parents or some other person has sinned, and that's why they're in this bad situation. She says, not at all. This has happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Or in other translations, so that the glory of God Maybe displayed in his life. You know, I think that all came back to us in the life of our sister, Lisa Johnson. You know, Lisa was raised in a family that got divorced when she was a young girl. And that's a very hurtful thing when you come from a divorced family. And a lot of times you go, well, why? Well, of course, Lisa later on became a disciple of Jesus Christ. And then her mom remarried to a guy named Buzz. Well, both of them studied the Bible, and they got to be baptized disciples, and now they're leading the church down in Savannah, Georgia. Is that awesome? So that's a happy ending right there. Well, in the meantime, her father was pretty much hard-hearted for literally about 50 years. And sometimes when bad things happen in our families, it makes us get an attitude towards God or doubt God. But what happened at the beginning of the summer, Lisa found out because her father told her that he had lung cancer. And yet in Lisa's mind, she knew that something was happening because she understood that God was sovereign, that everything happens for a reason so that the work of God, so that the glory of God might be displayed in his life. Well, here's what happened. Her 70-year-old dad got taken aback by the fact he had lung cancer. He sensed his mortality. He started studying the Bible. Three weeks later, he was baptized. And a couple weeks after that, his wife was baptized. Is that flat awesome or not? So you see, we understand, we understand if we're disciples, if we understand the sovereignty of God, that everything happens for a reason, so that the work, the glory of God may be displayed in our lives. Is that fire you on up? Well, look at this. Having said this, Jesus spit on the ground. He goes, <laughs> he made some mud with the saliva, put it on the man's eyes. So he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was, and others said, No, 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 no. It only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I'm the man. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. 
Well, where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Now, isn't this ironic? Here, Jesus just gives this incredible lofty teaching that the hurting things in this life, the hurting things in our lives are there so that the work, the glory of God may be displayed in our lives. And he goes, <laughs> spits on the ground. See, spit changes everything. He bends down and he takes mud. Mud. I mean, there's nothing grosser than spit. And then you make mud out of the spit. Now, there's non-spit mud and there's spit mud. Now, non-spit mud is bad, but spit mud, that's about as gross you get. Because guys got the slime in it. You know what I'm talking about? And Jesus used spit mud. Special concoction. Holy spit mud. And he wipes it on the dude's eyes. And he says, listen, you go wash in the pool of Siloam and you'll see. Now, if he hadn't have gone by faith to trust and obey, then I don't think he'd have been able to see. But this man, having holy spit mud on his eyes, goes to pool of Siloam and he, he sees. He's fired up. People can't believe it. Say, wow, no, 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 no. That must be a different guy. Can't be him. And he says, no, no, I'm the man. See, it is in the Bible. You can say, I am the man. <laughs> How did it happen? He says, well, this, it's, it's, it's this guy, Jesus. Well, let's, let's, let's keep reading right here. Verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, the day in which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him, how to receive his sight? He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a sinner do such a miraculous sign so they were divided? You know, sometimes we get this mindset that Jesus brings people together. Well, Jesus brings people together that have him as Lord. Amen. But let me tell you something. The word of God and Jesus preaching can divide people. And the people right here that were against him, the Pharisees, says, oh, man, this can't this can't be of God because he did it on a Sabbath. He did it on a Saturday, the holy day. Now, you know, I, I think, you know, the Lord is is God and he's very smart. I think Jesus waited till Saturday. Now, he could have fixed up this dude on Thursday or Friday. But he goes, I'm waiting for Saturday. See, the Lord enjoyed the weekend, too. He says, I can't wait for Saturday because I am going to flat to a miracle. <laughs> and, of course, he did it very purposely so that people would have to have their hearts tested about whether or not they see God working or they're holding on to their traditions. Are you with me right here? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 17. Finally, they turn again to the blind man. What do you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He replied, he, he's a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he'd been blind and had received the sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? We know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. Now, there's a bold set of parents. Amen. <laughs> his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That is why his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. You see... At all times, choosing truth and taking a stand means that you might be put out of the synagogue. It may, it may put you on the outs with people you want to be on the in on. But you see, truth must take precedent over relationship. But when relationships are based on truth, there is a unity that cannot be broken. Are you with me right here, guys? Verse 24. A second time, they summoned the man who had been born blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man's a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. 
one thing I do know, I once was blind, but now I see. I mean, the, the words of amazing grace just come ringing through right there. Amen, guys? Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already, you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Is that awesome? He starts to get evangelistic right there. Well, now Jesus explains the whole situation. Drop on down, if you would. In verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I've come into the world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees were with him, heard him say this, says, What? Are we blind too? A little defense in this right there, amen. She said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. You know, here's something that we all have to give up. We, we know in all our cars, we have what's called a blind spot. Right? Have, have you ever noticed that? You pull into a lane, you go, someone honks at you because the other car was in your blind spot. And it's a funny thing. Sometimes you get ticked off at him. But you're the one that pulled out in front of them. You know what I'm talking about right here? Well, here's the truth. It's that all of us as people, we have blind spots. That's why we need God. That's why we need other disciples in our lives so we can see our blind spots. You know, what happens after a period of time, if you don't have someone helping you with your blind spots, you become blind to your own sin. And this happens with a lot of people that even go to church. They have the outward facade of looking religious, and they've acted that way so long, living a double life, that they start to believe it themselves. It's kind of like the, the story of the guy that was looking for a job. I think some of our college students can relate to that. And he looked all around for a job. Couldn't find one. Finally, he goes to the visiting circus. And uh, he says, hey, do you have a job? He says, no, no, we don't have a job. But, well, there's, well, there's sort of one job. He goes, oh, I'll, I'll take it. What, what is it? He says, well, just yesterday our ape died. And we don't have any other apes in the circus. And, uh, well, we do have an ape costume. And if you'd be willing to wear it and act like an ape, that would, that would help us just get more tickets and more people coming to the circus. He says, well, I don't have a choice. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. So to the guy's surprise, he started getting fired up about being an ape. And he saw that the crazier he acted inside of the cage, the more people would come to see him. And he had an, actually a rope inside of the cage. And so he, people got especially fired up when he started swinging on the rope back and forth. Well, it was an open-top type cage. It was a traveling circus. And so in the cage next to him was the lion's cage. And so it was really awesome when he'd swing out of his own cage and over the lion's cage. And more and more people said, oh, that's awesome. Have you seen that courageous ape? And everybody's going crazy, you know, when the ape would swing on over. Well, one day he was swinging and the rope snapped. And the guy in the ape costume falls into the lion's cage. He just freaks out. He goes, help, help, save me. And then the lion says, shut up or you'll get us both fired. Sometimes we start believing the facade, the costume that we wear. But Jesus says, hold it. I will not allow you to be blind. You who think you see, you're the blind ones. And as people who love Jesus, we've got to open our eyes to the truth. Amen? So you see, our first point is very simple. Spit and mud will change your life. Our second point. Spit up and get up. Turn to Acts chapter 9. Let's look at another blind man. Acts 9. Here we read about Saul who becomes the Apostle Paul. Verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked for him, for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. 
I am Jesus whom he persecuted, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They, they heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. I mean, right here, we find a man that was passionate about his beliefs. He did everything he could to thwart Christianity called the way. He not only traveled throughout Jerusalem and Judea, but he was on his way to Damascus, Syria. He was not only putting him in prison, he was killing Christians. That's how much he believed. One day, on the road to Damascus, this ball of light bowls him on over. And he hears this voice. And the voice says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Have you ever thought that you were just so right about something and found that you were so wrong? I mean, there is just this sinking, nauseous feeling inside of your stomach. Here is a man that was killing people over this guy, Jesus, and he finds out that Jesus is real. What? It just hits his heart. It hits his stomach. He, he just feels so nauseous. Then he tries to open his eyes, but when he opens his eyes, the Bible says he couldn't see. He was blind. Now, this is of God. Because God wanted to show Saul that even though he thought he saw the truth, in actuality, he was blind. And so he wanted to show Saul, hey, you're not right with God because you are in the darkness. I mean, close your eyes. What do you see? Darkness. You know you're in the darkness. Notice another thing. He kept Saul in this condition for three days. Why? To stamp in darkness indelibly upon his heart and on his mind that Jesus was dead for three days and then he resurrected. Amen, guys? Powerful lesson for our future brother Paul. Hey, amen. Let's read on. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision. Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Stray Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And, he, and he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Now, it's like, you know, this is, Ananias is like a lot of us. We think that God doesn't know what's going on in our lives. What, Lord? Are you kidding me? Don't you know this guy is killing Christians? The Lord's not going to mess around with the conversation. Verse 15. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and placing his hands on Saul, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. Is that a cranking story or not? I mean, this is amazing. You know, it, 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 we see here that, that Paul turns because at first he gets confronted with the truth and he just gets that nauseous feeling in his stomach. But then God sends Ananias to deliver the truth, and he responds by repenting and getting baptized. Amen? But isn't it interesting also that here Ananias, whom we never hear about again in the Scriptures, is sent by God to preach the word to this murderous persecutor. Have you ever been given a challenge that you just felt is overwhelming? What, what, what do you get in your stomach? That queasy feeling again. You know what I'm talking about? But the Lord says, go. He says, hey, spit up, get it out, and get up. You know how it is. You know, you get, you get the flu or you get nauseous, and sometimes you're just, oh, just all gunky inside, and you're just there, and you go, you know, I just need to head to the restroom. You know, you give it on up, you go, oh, 
I feel so much better. I got that out. You know what I'm talking about? Well, that's like Ananias. And it reminds me of, of just something that happened just a couple of weeks ago in Chicago with a, a young disciple named uh, Joel Parlour. He's a college student. And uh, Joe, Joe, Joel was just walking back uh, late at night in, in a very, very, very rough area of Chicago. And he was just kind of bebopping along, you know. He's talking on his cell phone, you know. And, and Joel's a, a great college kid. He's, you know, about a six foot two thin white guy. And all of a sudden, he's just oblivious to everything. All of a sudden, there's seven guys surrounding him. The lead guy's a, a black guy, big black guy. And then he's got seven Latinos right there. And he finally senses, you know, maybe I'm in the wrong neighborhood right here. And it, the, the, the lead guy goes, hey, man, let's talk. Now, now Joel tries to play cool. You know, have you ever been in a bad situation? You go, you just want to play cool. You are dying. You're, you're nauseous. You're scared to death. So Joel goes, what's up, man? You know, he tries to play cool. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> And then, and then the guy didn't say anything, and he kind of reached his pocket, and he realized he's got some church invitation. The, the guy goes, hey, uh, I'd like to invite you to my church. And the guy goes, are you blanking kidding me? <laughs> Puts it in the bag. <laughs> Says, hey, we want that backpack. And they start closing in on him. And then the guy goes, okay, kid. Why to get out of here? Go home! He's freaked out. He just runs all the way back to brothers. He says, brothers, we gotta pray. You know, and he, he got steadied in the Lord. Well, anyway, next day, his phone rings. And uh, the, the, the person on the other line goes, Hey, uh, this is Leonard. Is uh, Joel there available? He goes, Hey, this this is Joel. He says, yeah, this is uh, Leonard. We, we met last night. <laughs> well, hold it. I, I, I don't remember exactly. Well, you remember back in that alley and everything? I had six of my friends with me. Oh, Leonard. He says, yeah, I want to come to your church. And so this past Sunday, Leonard came to church and he's now studying the Bible. Is that awesome, guys? You see, you never know. Who's going to become? You may have that pit in your stomach. But daggone it, you got to preach the word, amen? you got to spit up and get up. Let's look at Paul's conversion a little bit more. Go to Acts chapter 22. Now in Acts 22 is Paul himself telling about his conversion. Let's pick up the action in verse 12. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you've seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. You know, right here, a lot of us kind of think that here the great Apostle Paul at his conversion must have just said, oh, man, where's the water? I want to get baptized. Now, he had to have another guy get in there and, and motivate him and say, hey, dude, the time has come. God has a great destiny for your life. And God has a great destiny for all of our lives. Amen. But it can't begin to be fulfilled until you become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so right here. Ananias, who's feeling greatly encouraged at this point, much like Joel was probably after the phone call from Leonard right there. He says, Paul, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. You know, it, it's kind of sad, but uh, the religious world today is just full of all kinds of traditions that blind people. You know, there are two major traditions that blind people about salvation. You know, the first tradition has been held since 500 A.D., but in that particular time, the church of that day decreed that baptizing infants was good enough to save them. Now, you know, you can imagine, if you've ever been to an infant baptism or sprinkling, I mean, let's face it, the babies aren't fired up about it. 
They don't remember it. That's salvation. And it's a late tradition. 500 A.D. 500 years ago, Columbus was discovering America. That's a long time since the first century. Do you see what I'm saying? The other tradition is even later. The other tradition is called praying Jesus in your heart. This started in the 1800s in America. They used to have the big tent meetings. And the preacher get on up there and people feel guilty. He says, okay, anybody that wants to respond, you come up front and sit. And the front, the front pew was called the mourner's bench. So you guys were on the mourner's bench. And what was said to them, he says, you pray until you feel saved. But see, we need, we need to understand that if we're going to please God, we got to take off the blinders of our traditions. Are you with me right here, guys? So we can see. And we got to look at the Bible. In the Bible, baptism was an adult decision that had faith and repentance and being disciple accompany it. And then you got your sins forgiven to receive the Holy Spirit. And that's what happened to Paul right here. I mean, even, even on the radio back when I was a little kid, they, they used to sing the song, you know, Oh, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. You remember that one, don't you? Well, I mean, they even sing about it on the popular radio show. He's talking about the fact that at baptism, your sins are washed away. But it is amazing when people get confronted with the tradition, they get ticked off. Why? Because what you're saying is you're not right with God. And, and, and that, that ticks most of us off. I, I still remember uh, being a freshman in college and someone sitting down with me on a Sunday night in a church pew. I was all fired up about this church. I love the fellowship. I just kind of wanted to blend in. I said, oh, man, I'll join this church. And then one night they sat down with me and they taught me how to become a real Christian. Now, I was leading a double life. I had so convinced myself I was a Christian, I, I, I put on a facade to my fraternity brothers about being religious. Yet I was drinking and going to the parties. I was messing around with women. But I was on church on Sunday morning, and I was a Christian. And who the heck do these people think they are saying, I'm not right with God? Because I know I feel saved. See, feelings and truth are just not the same. You know how us husbands are. Sometimes we feel like our marriages are going great. Ask the wife, and we know that's not, it. That's not true, is it? See, feelings, feelings and sincerity do not equal truth. Truth is the word of God. Now, you know, when, when someone speaks the truth to you and you're not doing it, your first feeling is you get ticked. Then you get this sinking, nauseous feeling down there because you know you're not doing it. You know what I'm talking about? And then you got to get in the word of God and you got to let God speak to you. I got in the word all that night, all the next day. And then late on Monday night, I was baptized into Christ. And you know, it was great because I just got open about my sins. I got open about all the impurity. Got open about all the drinking. Got open about all, all the garbage in my life. And you know, it's kind of like having the flu and just throwing it all up. You feel so much better. So here's the bottom line. You got to spit up and get up. And even Paul had to be urged, hey, it's time to get baptized. Get up and wash away your sins. How many of us have been studying the Bible for days, for weeks, and we still haven't made that decision? What's the issue? It's our hearts. We've been blinded by traditions. So the first point was simple. Spit and mud. Second, spit up and get up. And the third point is, spit and don't miss. Turn to Mark chapter 8. Thank you. Verse 22. The cane of Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? 
He looked up and said, I, I see people, they look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. Now right here, don't, don't you get this incredible, awesome feeling in your heart? Jesus goes up to the blind guy. He goes, hey dude, let's just spend a little time. Takes him by the hand, and they walk out of the city. And is, doesn't that feel good? He says, hey, dude, just, I need to talk to you for a second. <laughs> That's what it says. That's what it says. Look at the text. It's a good thing Jesus didn't miss. Jesus spit on this guy. He didn't make the holy spit mud. This is just spit. Pure holy spit. See, spit changes everything. I'm trying to convince you guys of that. And the guy goes back, I guess he goes, oh wow, what are all these things? They look like, I think they're like trees or something moving all around. And just hold on, we, we, we got a little bit more work to do right here. And so he touches him a second time. And he could see everything clearly. Thank God for the second touch of grace. How many of us have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and then turned our backs only later to come back to it? I think of the young man that uh, is going to be baptized today, Ricky. Ricky is a cranking young man. And, uh, but, you know, he, he came to the church about a year ago, and he says, hey, you know, I don't want it. And he turned his back on the truth. But then things happen in his life, as we talked about today, so that the glory of God may be displayed in his life. Amen, guys? And today, he's going to be baptized into Christ. Thank God, God gave him another year of life. I'm really fired up about uh, Aaron Corbin. I mean, she is, she's, she's like a daughter to Elena and me. Uh, her family was in the church here when we first came and they, they embraced us so warmly. And uh, she became a disciple. She's fired up, but then the world took her out. And it just, it just kills you when someone leaves the Lord. You know what I'm talking about? But today I'm, I'm so fired up because Jesus is going to touch her again. And she's coming back to him for the second touch of grace. Is that awesome, guys? You know, there may be many of us in here that need the second touch of grace. Let's go to our last scripture in 2 Peter chapter 1. Sometimes the first time is not enough. In 2 Peter chapter 1 is, is an incredible passage. It says in verse 5, he's talking to Christians right here. He says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Right here, Peter is talking to people that have been Christians for a while. And says, you've got to understand, no, no matter how long you've been a Christian, you need to be growing in these essential areas. You need to be adding to your faith goodness. You need to be adding to your goodness knowledge, then self-control, then kindness and perseverance and brotherly kindness and love. Now, we've got to ask ourselves a little bit. Are we growing? Just, hey, maybe start from the beginning of the summer to date. That's about four months. Have you been growing in your faith? Have you been growing in your knowledge have you been growing in your perseverance, your godliness, your love? If you have, then I know that you've been productive and effective in touching other people's lives and having them become Christians. Amen? But you know, those of us that stop growing, we're going to not only be ineffective and unproductive, but the truth is, 
if someone's not growing, according to verse 9, if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. You see, when we are cleansed of our sins, we get so grateful to God. Are you with me right here? But when we forget that, we lose motivation. But look at this. It says we become nearsighted and blind. Not just blind, but nearsighted. What does it mean to be nearsighted? I can tell you all about it, because I am. See, I can read nearsighted. I don't need any glasses. But if I was to look back at the back of the auditorium, well, to be truthful, about the fifth row, pe people look like trees. You know what I'm talking about? Because, see, I can only see near. So what's, what's Peter saying? He says, well, people that have forgotten really how awesome it is to have their sins forgiven, they cannot see far. They no longer have a vision for their life. They no longer have dreams for their life. All they're looking is at their myopic little life. They're just nearsighted, and they become blind about where they really stand in the Lord. You know, not only can this happen to an individual Christian, but it can happen to a whole church. You know, a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the minister over in Hilo, Hawaii, asked us to go over there and to rebuild the foundation of the church to be sold out disciples. And, and you know, that's a, a radical task. I mean, that, that's a task that where you preach the word of God, you know some people are going to leave. And the history of the church was quite simple. Back in its heyday a few years ago, the Hilo church had 70 disciple members, and they would have an attendance of 90, 100 every Sunday. Well, in recent years... They'd, they'd, they'd kind of slowly drifted away. They'd begun to forget that God had cleansed them of their past sins. And Sunday morning, they were having 35 or 40. That included the children. Wednesday night, they were having 10 to 15. And you, you and I both know that's the real core of the church, right? Well, we went on over there. Elaine and I just preached the word. We got with the, the minister, Kyle, and his wife, Joan. We got with the two shepherding couples, and we just laid it out. Well, at the end of, of, of those days, out of all those people, only 12 were left. You say, well, what can 12 people do? Well, 12 people who turned the world upside down for Jesus Christ. Amen, guys? You know what's awesome? Just one week later at their first service, those 12 sold-out disciples had 14 visitors. Is that awesome or not? Here's the exciting thing. Kyle had his mom there, and she's studying the Bible. Joan had her mom there, and she's studying the Bible. Joan had her two brothers there, and they're both studying the Bible. There are three campus students. Two of them are studying the Bible, and two people are close to getting baptized. Is that flat awesome or not? See, this is, this is in a church... This is a church that hadn't had any baptisms all year. That's how dead it had become. Now, we've got to look at this individually and collectively. Just because you make the decision to be a sold-out disciple one time in your life, let's face it, all of us drift from time to time, don't we? And we have to be called back to remember how awesome the grace of God is. Secondly, as a church, we need to have a deep conviction that God wants his church composed of only sold-out disciples. And when you have sold-out disciples, I mean the electricity in the church, the singing is vibrant, the fellowship is strong, and God can use those people to bring other people to the Lord. Amen, guys? See, we, we, we have to have a deep conviction that spit changes everything. Thanks, and God bless.